Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're gonna talk about zero contrast targets. If you've been following the channel for a little while or you've been to a Sage Dynamics class, thank you for that, uh, you probably know by now that I like introducing as much realism as possible into shooting. Biggest problem we have with live fire shooting is everything is going to be very unrealistic and we get realism uh, in measured ways, but there's always gonna be some kind of artificiality in the way that we practice or the way that we train. One of the biggest places that we see that artificiality is in the targets that we use. Targets themselves, usually right out of the gate, are unrealistic because they're two-dimensional pieces of paper or somewhat silhouette-style cardboard, but they're still two-dimensional, whereas people are three-dimensional. So it already kind of presupposes that your threat's going to give you an ideal presentation versus confronting a three-dimensional person who may turn sideways, crouch down, use cover, give you marginal exposure because they're using cover concealment, so on and so forth. So we kind of have to deal with that, but we don't necessarily want to start beginning our, 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 I should say, begin our skill development on a more difficult target because we still need to get the fundamentals of shooting down. Once we're ready to introduce as much realism, realism as possible into our targets, we have to start thinking about what kind of target we should be using. And there are a lot of targets out there. One of the most common types of targets you're likely to see is some type of human form. It may have an anatomy or some kind of scoring zone or just a general human shape. Of course, you can also shoot at squares and triangles and circles. I tend to stay away from those because uh, I'm all about accuracy on the human form, not necessarily accuracy on threatening geometric shapes. Uh, there's value there. It's just not something I personally care to use or, or, or use for training purposes in classes. So I wanna go with a humanoid type target. And a lot of the humanoid type targets out there have a lot of contrast to them, which means scoring zones, the critical scoring zones, are identified usually in a color or a shape or some kind of gradient to show you this is where you need to shoot, which is great. But eventually we need to start to get away from that because when we think about what we're ultimately practicing and training for, it's gonna be delivery of gunfire to a lethal threat. And a lethal threat is probably not gonna have convenient scoring zones. Now, is this just semantics? I will absolutely tell you that it is not. And I can say that definitively because I have a very large sample size. I've uh, been teaching with Sage Dynamics for almost 10 years now, been teaching even longer than that. And I've taught with students shooting on a multitude of different styles of targets. And in that time, one thing I have consistently observed is the more contrast a target has, the better a student will shoot, which is great, right? But what if the target doesn't have that contrast? Uh, contrasting points of aim can create a type of uh, a crutch, if you will. It's not a bad thing. Like I said, that's a place to begin our skill development, but eventually we should, and this is just my philosophy, lean towards less contrasting targets because they more replicate real life. If you have a threat and he's just wearing a solid color dark t-shirt, you don't have a convenient scoring zone to show you where the heart is or where the high thoracic necessarily is, so you're depending on your ability to bracket off of anatomy to get those hits. I, this is my preferred target. This is one of my go-to targets. This is actually part of a three-dimensional system I use in classes. This is just the 2D cardboard backer. It has two scoring zones you're probably familiar with, at least terminology-wise, A zone, B zone. A zone is a four by six box, which if you know from traditional A zones, that's much smaller than a comp your average competition A zone. The B zone box is eight and a half by 11. I like this target because it's brown cardboard and most ranges have brown berm. So it's a very, very, very low contrasting target for accuracy purposes. So when students have to shoot on these, when they're closer, they can track their hits. They see their little black bullet holes and whether they do it on purpose or not, they have a tendency to shoot where those hits are. So I'm constantly reminding students, shoot where you want to hit, not necessarily where you've shot. If where you're hitting is where you want to shoot, then by all means continue on. But some people will start grouping to the right, not necessarily because there's something wrong with their fundamentals, although that could be part of it, but also because they're shooting at their bullet holes because it's a contrasting point of aim. One of the cliches that we hear a lot in shooting is aim small, miss small, and that actually is very true. So just for demonstrational purposes, there's a drill that I like to do. I shoot it on this target, which is a critical point of aim right here. I've got my A zone, which is a four by six box, roughly approximates the size and location of the human heart when you take a three dimensional object and make it two dimensional. Very simplistic cardboard. Then I've got my B zone, which uh, covers the a uh, good portion of the critical regions of the thoracic cavity, some of the lungs, pulmonary arteries and veins, vena cava, aorta, that kind of stuff. And the heart, of course, is in the middle of it. Uh, this is what I'm gonna shoot for. I'm gonna shoot from 25, 20, 15, 10, and five yards each distance, and you can run it front to back or back to front, I'm gonna shoot five rounds from my normal carry position. 
For this drill, I'm using my everyday carry gun, which is a Glock 19X. It has been modified by Agency Arms. You'll probably recognize it uh, from the Instagram or from a class, or uh, you'll be like, hey, that suspiciously looks like the Sage Dynamics Edition pistol. And you'd be right. This is the predecessor to that gun with the last prototype of the Sage Comp before we put it into production for the Sage gun. But it's a 9mm 19X, so I've got the, the grip size of a 17, and with the comp, it's roughly the same length, almost exactly the same length as a Glock 17, which is kind of my preferred footprint for carry gun. I'm going to be shooting 124 grain Federal, uh, in case anybody's curious about that. I tend to shoot 115 uh, as little as possible because it feels like cheating a little bit. Uh, although I do st still shoot quite a bit of it, I shoot more 124 because that's my carry weight. Now for my first run, I'm just going to shoot on the cardboard. I'm adding no contrast whatsoever to the target. You can shoot these uh, strings, this whole drill, the 25 all the way into the 5, you can shoot it on a par time if you want to. You don't have to, but it, if you're running on an indoor range where you can't use a shot timer or you have the ability to use a shot timer and you kind of like to challenge yourself and introduce that other metric of time, because we already have distance and we already have accuracy, so adding time to it just increases the difficulty, if you will. So if you're interested in the par times, it starts at seven seconds and you lose a second every distance you get closer to the target. So from 25 is at seven, 20 is at six, 15 is at five, 10 is at four, five is at three seconds. And that's how it goes. Or you can run it from the back to the front or from the front to the back, any way you wanna do it. I wouldn't start in the middle because that might get confusing. So very, very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shoot this thing on a zero contrast target, the cardboard, which, uh, is complicated in its own ways, but it's not the hardest way to do this. So here's what we ended up with. Majority of my hits are A zone hits, which is exactly what we were looking for. But I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven B zone hits. These are still high thoracic hits, and the only ones that I'm really not happy about are these three down here, because I feel that's the lower you go, the less critical organs are behind that direct bullet path. And I got an accidentally on purpose hit to the throat, which is kind of like tapping the maple tree, so we'll take what we can get. But overall, not terrible accuracy. I've shot better, I've shot worse. I wanted to give you guys kind of an organic look at this. In fact, the very first uh, rounds I fired at the range today were on this target cold, which gives us a really good value to it. Now, just shooting zero contrast cardboard is difficult enough, but as I said, the closer I get, because I shot it from 25 into five instead of going to five back, the closer I got, the more I could see my hits. So that gave me, whether I was doing it on purpose or not, uh, gave me the ability to kind of track a contrasting point of aim. And because I shoot a red dot handgun and I'm target focused, it's very easy for me to track hits even subconsciously. If you don't have solid targets like that, or you're using something that has a lot of contrast to it, like a white target with black scoring zones or something like that, very easy solution to come up with, something I do even on cardboard, is a black t-shirt. I go to Goodwill and I buy a bunch of the 3X size t-shirts and I cut them in half so I get two out of one, and I'll staple this up on the target like the target is wearing the shirt. Shooting against black fabric, unless the target is backlit by the sun or some kind of lighting source, you're really not gonna see your hits even at five yards. At three, you can kind of make out where you're hitting, and I like to think this is the most maximum realism I can get for a, sim for a simple solution uh, based on, you know, simple two-dimensional targets. So yeah, I can make this way more realistic. Another thing I do is I take a three-dimensional target and put a full shirt on it and shoot with varying presentations of the target. That's uh, uh, a little bit more complex and a little bit more cost involved and some ranges are not going to allow you to do that. So even this, this is something you could get away with in an indoor range very easily. Most indoor ranges have 25 yards available. It might not be a true 25 yard, but it's close enough in some cases. And sometimes you got to deal with what you got. So if you can't shoot out the 25, you can't shoot out the 25. But most ranges are going to give you that. And I would highly suggest if you're going to shoot this drill, you do it from 25 to 5 or from 5 to 25. And uh, once you're comfortable with it, start shooting at the part time. But anyway, I'm going to put this shirt up over that silhouette, same silhouette, and I'm going to go ahead and shoot it again with the part time, starting at 25, working my way into five yards.
So here's our target after we fired from 25 all the way into five. And this is what, oh, okay, this is what our hits are looking like. Still really good consistent A zone hits, but I've still got some Bs. You'll notice the shot group is a little higher. However, it is a little bit more spread out. So we'll go ahead and grab this real quick for a side-by-side -side comparison. This is the one I shot just on cardboard. This is the t-shirt where the t-shirt was kind of obscuring where my hits were, so I wasn't able to track them. Some people may look at this and think, well, you know, it's a war of inches. This is a much tighter group. I could have subconsciously been looking at my hits and tracking those hits. So I was shooting where I wanted to hit, and I was kind of cheating, if you will. Not necessarily anything wrong with that, especially if you do it subconsciously. It's kind of a hard habit to break. But when we compare it to the t-shirt shot group, we can see that overall my point of aim was a little more, I guess, vague, if you will. I was not able to pinpoint an exact point of aim other than using the human anatomy. So the way that I kind of address shooting center high thoracic cavity is I'm going to look at the standard shoulder width that I'm presented with. Uh, with a red dot gun, I use the optic body itself to kind of give me a rough estimation of how far away I am from the target even though with this drill it's known distances, but applying that to the street, if you will. Uh, I know how much of the width of my optic the target either is inside of or outside of, roughly, based on distance, because I've shot a lot of targets with an RMR or, or a reticle or an optic in general, so the optic acts as kind of a rough range finder just based on its width and its height. And I bracket that and even it up as much as possible, and I tend to go just below neckline. So worst case scenario, I'm hitting high A versus trying to aim center of the A and dropping my shots, shots low B. Now there's a bunch of other fundamental uh, inefficiencies that can play into this to cause you to shank shots low or shoot left or shoot right. We're not really focused on that so much for this purposes. So there could be some fundamental issues going on in here, but more than likely, it's just the fact that my point of aim is more vague. And I have a really good way to kind of add to the evidence of my hypothesis. So here's a high contrast target. This is my Cadence Standards target, which is uh, same size. So the B zone is 8.5 by 11. This gray box is the 4 by 6, which is our desired point of impact for this particular drill. You can kind of ignore the white box in the middle. It serves a different purpose, but it's still a good place to hit. You'll notice, because I shot this drill on a high contrast, I've got a white point of aim on a brown background. It gives me really good contrast. I shot this same time limit, 25 all the way into five, seven, six, five, four, three par times, and I'm consistently in the A zone and hardly anything is out of the A at all. And if it is, it's, it's in the B. We always shoot center mass, which is center of target offered or selected. So even at 25, when my dot takes up a considerable amount of this, uh, this here uh, A zone, um, if I aim for the center of the B, I'm going to hit the A because the A is in the center of the B, so on and so forth. So the, the underlying point here is the more contrast a target has available, the, more, the likely you are to shoot a little bit more accurately, a little bit more consistently, and maybe even a little more quickly, which is not a bad thing. However, if you're really pushing yourself to, to kind of explore the realism without getting into the whole tactical Timmy combat role nonsense, this is something you can do to test yourself. If you shoot really well on a high contrast target, I would highly recommend you shoot this drill or a drill like it uh, with zero contrast, especially using the t-shirt drill, and see if you're getting the same performance. I did a video on this years ago. Uh, and I wanted to kind of refresh it with new and exciting information. The main reason I'm bringing this up now is because a lot of people are starting to shoot red dot handguns as they should, because red dots are not even the future anymore. They're the now. It's the best way for us to use a firearm in self-defense to use a reticle because it allows us to be threat focused. People tend to shoot better threat focused. One of the possible disadvantages visually to a red dot is the human eye wants to stare at the most interesting thing in front of it. And if you're shooting at a zero contrast target, you may find yourself staring at the dot versus staring at the target like you're supposed to be. When that happens, it's good to practice a drill that helps you get out of that habit. You can still shoot decently accurate by staring at the dot with a red dot, but they're not designed to be used that way. And you will shoot better being target focused and superimposing the dot over what you want to hit versus using the alternative method or the old front sight focus method that you get from iron sights. Because we're target focused with a red dot sight, a drill like this is very valuable because it shows us what we're actually capable of doing versus what the target is helping us do. The target should just record your shooting. It shouldn't assist you in any great way in your shooting, if that makes any sense. Uh, and I think it does. So whether you shoot this drill or not, explore as many options as possible to add as much realism, realism as possible to your self-defense practice. Uh, it, it's difficult to kind of sometimes separate the tactical stuff from the common sense stuff. 
And the number one question I always ask myself is what value other than an achievement am I getting from this particular drill or this particular target? So if something I'm if I'm doing a drill for the sake of doing the drill, what what lessons is the drill in designed to test, reinforce or teach? So if a drill doesn't test, reinforce or teach things, then it just becomes kind of like an entertainment thing and there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you're pursuing. But some drills can give us a false sense of confidence based on how we approach them or what kind of targets we use or what kind of conditions we shoot them under or how generous the part times are. And you can really go down the, the quote unquote rabbit hole when you start exploring those things. Uh, I like to keep my training as organic as possible, my practice as organic as possible, and I'm always pursuing trying to add the most maximum realism that I can to any kind of thing that I'm doing with the firearm if I'm focused on shooting for practice proficiency and maintenance. If I'm just out to shoot and have fun, then it doesn't really matter. But if I'm trying to take it serious and I'm trying to think about skills that, that may benefit me and I'm thinking about most likely skills to least likely skills, uh, these are some of the maintenance aspects I'm going to look at when I look at when I use my targets. It's, it's very rare that I use high contrasting targets unless they serve a very specific purpose. And of course, this is just my philosophy. But if you come to a Sage class, you're going to see this. I believe that we should prepare for the worst possible scenario eventually in our skill set uh, in regards to having a convenient point of aim on our threat. The best way to do that with a two-dimensional target is to have zero contrast or as little contrast as possible because that's worst case scenario. Your bad guy's not wearing anything that gives you a convenient point of aim in the high thoracic or, or other way. Uh, the second thing that we should kind of think about is how much value are we going to get from the repetition and is there a continue impro continual improvement or scoring methodology. In live fire training, we have time, distance, and accuracy. Those are our three common metrics. But in real life, we may not be aware of any of those metrics until the situation actually turns into a use of force. So we gotta keep our training and our practice as varied as possible. Uh, if we work our way towards zero contrast targets, then at least visually, and shooting is mostly visual, we are prepared to confront that situation. And if you're using a red dot handgun, I highly recommend getting away from, at least sometimes, the, the high contrast, very conveniently contrast scoring zone targets and start working on something that uh, replicates real life, even though it's still very artificial, uh, replicates it a little bit more. I'm Eric Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.